my screen, my, my, my PowerPoint screen. And if everything works correctly, let us see here. Aha, all right. Can everybody see this, uh, the image of the two parrots? Yes, that's perfect. All righty. Welcome so to Phoenix we're... Landing. We really appreciate you being here today. Thank you so much. And uh, just to kind of cup, just by way of uh, parenthetically, I was able, I had the privilege of actually visiting uh, down, I guess it was uh, three or four years ago and met some wonderful people. But here we are in the Zoom era and uh, it's almost as good. And it's also nice that I gather from the chat, we've got folks from Texas, Maryland, Virginia, Canada, and even the UK. Um, and so that's, that's terrific. So without further ado, let us turn our attention to the wild parrots of Brooklyn. I'm in Brooklyn here. It's a beautiful day in Brooklyn today. And uh, if I weren't here, I'd probably be out there looking at them. But here we have a picture of them. And if you'll notice, if you'll, you'll notice each one of those uh, guys has in their hand or in their foot a, a piece of pizza. This is not a fake photograph. Uh, the Brooklyn parrots like pizza. And that kind of ties into one of the remarkable things about the monk parakeet. Um, such a, a varied diet, such an adaptable creature. Uh, it seems uh, really there's there's almost nothing you you, you can throw at, at at these uh these parrots without them adapting to it and somehow triumphing over every hurdle. Um, so uh, this is our my my update. There's a lot of information that's in it that hasn't changed, but there is some some information uh, in it that that's sort of if not breaking news, it's updated information. And um, uh, it, I'm sure we're going to be hearing from folks uh, who, who also have things to say about, about what's going on with the Quakers, the wild parrots in their, own, in their own regions, because they're so widely dispersed. I think they're in 23 states now in the, the United States that makes them the most successful naturalized uh, wild parrot we've got. So anyway, let's see if I can advance the screen. Yes. OK, here we go. So we got a couple of graphs here. The one I want to talk is uh, the kind of the big picture. Are these parrots expanding in population? And uh, oh, I'm hearing a little echo here. I don't know if that's me or somebody else. I hear an echo. All right, let me see if yeah. I'm, hello, testing. That's better. That's better. All right, maybe I need to stand back a little bit. But um, anyway, uh, the top graph shows a, a, a rather remarkable increase in population um, in New York State. This is this is uh, going from like zero birds in 1985 to about 230 today. This is based on the Autobahn Christmas bird count, which may or may not be completely accurate. Um, but the larger, the, the lower graph shows that um, in, in the three states that, that I'm, you know, that are sort of in my backyard, New York, Connecticut, and New Jersey, the population really hasn't increased a lot. Now, why do I mention this? Because, you know, one of the, one of the wraps or one of the, the, the things that, that makes uh, the monk parakeet to some people sort of a threat, and I know this is the case in Europe more than it is in the U.S. right now, is this fear that they're, that, that once Re, uh, released into the wild, that the population will will increase exponentially. Sort of like what happened with the starling. The starlings were introduced here. Oh, I don't know. Back, I think it was back in the 1890s, and they were deliberately introduced. And they went from a population of about 75 birds to 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 what we see today, which is sort of billions and billions of them. They were worried about that happening with the monk parakeet. There's no evidence that that's happened. But I show these two graphs just to give you a kind of a, a, a census, probably not 100% accurate. Um, that lower graph, if you see that, that red line here, that, that Connecticut count, um, the population in Connecticut was expanding up until about 2005. But then there was a, um, uh, an eradication effort on the part of the utility company with the backing of the, uh, the USDA, the US Department of Agriculture. They killed, I think, about 300 birds. And uh, since that time, the population has dropped. Um, we'll get into sort of a little bit more of the nitty gritty of, of, of what's going on, uh, you know, 
the, the birds, are they doing well? Are they endangered? What's endangering them? What can we do? Um, and um, it's not as bleak as uh, uh, it seems, but the, the monk parakeet, you know, the wild monk parakeets have never really had a secure future in this country um, because they've always been regarded as uh, a potential pest, a uh, possible threat to, to agriculture, to other species. That's never been borne out in my opinion, but there is a nuisance factor associated with them, which we'll maybe get into a little bit. But let's talk about this bird in a little more depth. Oh yeah, one more graph. This is uh, Connecticut, New, New York, New Jersey, 1985 to 2015. You can see there was sort of a peak in the early 2000s, but then the population has uh, sort of leveled off. So let's talk about this bird because this is a very, <laughs> this is a very compelling creature. Uh, what manner of bird is this? And I, and I have this that says, you know, Brooklyn attitude. There's sort of a tough looking bird there with a, with a soft inner core, of course, but, but ready, ready for some street action if required. Intelligent, they're the second best talking parrot. They're resourceful. Um, they're omnivorous. They have a very wide ranging diet, which gives them a lot of advantages. They're very, very social. When these birds get together, you can't miss the experience. You'll hear it for blocks as they sort of conference very, very loudly. They're persistent, tough, and they're loud, which bothers certain people, but present company excluded. I love to hear that screeching and that squawking. It just makes me, it's primeval. Um, so anyway, a tough bird with an attitude. Folks out there, if you have them as pets, you probably know they're moody. They can be, you know, they can be, all lovey-dovey one moment, but then you do something that's a little off for them and you know they they might give you a little nip or a big one. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about the, the, the um, physical presentation, mostly green. It's very unusual to see green birds in the sky in the Northeast, but when a green bird comes by, it's most likely a monk parakeet, sort of has a, a um, a gray head, a bone-colored beak, and a long tail. And uh, of course, that's that's sort of the distinction between a parrot and a parakeet. I think of them as Quaker parrots because they've got all the characteristics of larger parrots that I've had experience with. They're they're great talkers, and they're they're uh, <laughs> they just have such expressive personalities. But they're they're diminutive. They're a little bit smaller than a pigeon, quite a bit bigger than a sparrow, but can't miss them. Um, they have a sort of a specialized feather structure that allows them to do certain things that you'll see them doing in, in the wild. They're, they can hover like little helicopters and that, that serrated structure and that wing allows them to do this. They can also fly very fast, but when they fly, they very rarely fly in a straight line. They're always zigzagging. I think that's because they're, they're, um, they're attuned to how they have to elude avian predators. And in New York City these days, there are quite a few avian predators. So that, that zigzag flight ability uh, gives them a certain edge. Um, they, of course, have that hook bill, which, which doubles as sort of a Swiss army knife. And of course, it can be used to intimidate an attacker. I've seen these parrots actually go head to head with, with falcons. And um, you know, they're, prob they're probably not going to win a fight with a falcon, but they can certainly make the falcon think twice about, about going after them, whereas a pigeon or another bird would, would not offer that level of, of uh, uh, defense. Uh, zygodactyl feet, of course, we're very familiar with that. You know, having those two toes in front and the two toes in back lets them make, lets them grab things and manipulate things just like our opposable thumb allows us to, 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 to make tools and, and use tools. Um, Little bit of history, where do they come from? They are from South America, of course. They're not from the tropics. They're from South, South America. The, uh, where they come from is about the same distance south from the equator that Brooklyn and, and the Northeast is uh, north of the equator. So when they arrived here, um, it took a little bit of adjustment, but they, uh, the climate that they found here was not that much different from what they, they, uh, they had in Argentina. Um, they have actually done some tests, some genetic tests on some captured birds here. I think Cornell Labs did some tests, and they found that they're all pretty closely related. 
uh, which suggests that um, the, the birds that we have here were captured from the same area um, uh, in Argentina. So Charles Darwin actually mentioned the monk parakeets when he went to Argentina in 1833. And I'm not sure exactly what he said about them, but I think he, he, uh, his remarks were that they were a remarkably adaptable uh, species uh, and that, had, that was able to sort of adapt optimally to, to its, its uh, high altitude sort of cliff, uh, cliff dwelling zone. Um, in the 1870s and 1890s, Argentina underwent a, an expansion of the railroad system to bring goods and materials in from the mountains into, into the main cities. The monk parakeets seem to have followed the railroad into town, into cities, into Buenos Aires. If you think about when they build a railroad, um, they haven't built one around here in a long time, but there's a lot of infrastructure associated with that, a lot of poles, a lot of a lot of uh, signal towers, a lot of human structures, and the parrots just sort of, we seem to sort of have leaped, leapfrogged along those rail lines into the cities where we find them today. Um, now this kind of ties in, this is a photo or an actual uh, um, uh, painting of a, of a Carolina parakeet. We have been without the Carolina parakeet for more than a hundred years. This was our uh, native born indigenous uh, North American parrot, unfortunately, due to um, a lot of different factors uh, that's now extinct, it's hunted to extinction. Um, it is a very similar bird to the monk parakeet, which suggests to me, although there's no evidence of this really, but you know, that there was sort of a, an ecological niche that the Carolina parakeet occupied that was left empty when the bird was, was hunted to extinction. And the monk parakeets have, have kind of come into that niche and are able to sort of survive in that same, within that same level of, of constraints. But we, we salute the Carolina parakeet. Uh, I know there's some kind of a wild project now to try to um, reanimate or reconstruct a woolly mammoth. It sounds a little bit crazy to me, but if they're going to go that far to try to bring back extinct creatures, well, why don't we start out with the Carolina parakeet? It's just a suggestion. But anyway, let's go on to, uh, oh yes, we, on the right panel here, we see our monk parakeet. Now, not exactly the same bird. The Carolina parakeet's a little more flamboyant with that orange head, but otherwise, like say morphologically, right? In, in terms of form, they're pretty similar looking. They, I might mistake one for the other. Uh, and it's sort of one, the good news to me and, and others is, is that, you know, yeah, we lost a great creature, but we've got another one. It happens to be an import, uh, but we should treat uh, the, the monk parakeet with some respect, especially given what we did in the Carolina parakeet. That was wrong. So let's go back into some recent history. Why are there these monk parakeets in 23 states in the United States? Why are they in Brooklyn? Why are they in Chicago? Why are they in Texas? Why are they in, in, in other states? Um, Massachusetts, uh, Connecticut, New Jersey. Well, it all begins back in the late 1950s. Now this is a poster from this famous Broadway musical, Evita, Evita Peron. She really had nothing to do with this. She was out of power by the time that the uh, drama occurred. But uh, one of her successors, Arturo Frondizi, it's a name you don't hear often these days, but you, you're gonna hear it right here. He wanted to really supercharge um, Argentina's agricultural economy in the late 1950s. And as you can see uh, from this graph, I'm not sure where I, where I got it, a very obscure site, uh, but they were trying to you know, get their agricultural production, especially their corn yield, way, way up. And so in the late 1950s, they talked to the farmers who were doing all of this work and the farmers said, you know, oh, these monk parakeets, they're making this our life impossible. We can't meet your numbers. We can't do what you want us to do. We can't grow all this corn because of these parrots. So what did the government do? They said, well, let's get rid of the parrots. Then we can meet our goals. Then we can have an export economy and we can be a world power, et cetera, et cetera. So they set upon a uh, very cruel eradication program. They went out and they killed, I think it was in the neighborhood of about half a million of them. Um, they incentivized the farmers. They said to them, if you shoot a monk parakeet, 
cut off the feet, send it into Buenos Aires, and we'll give you a reward. We'll give you a few pesos or whatever. So over the next uh, few months and years, uh, the agricultural office in Argentina began receiving thousands and thousands and thousands of, of feet that have been cut off birds. I know this is grisly, but I presume there are no kids watching at this early hour. But what they found out was that a lot of those feet that had been coming in were not monk parakeet feet. These were other birds that the farmers were just shooting at random and cutting off the feet. So there was fraud in that program. And they said, look, we got to stop this before the newspapers find out about it. And they did. So some genius had the idea of, look, it's rather than pursuing this crazy bounty program, it's full of fraud. Why don't we simply round up as many parrots as we can and send them out of the country? A, because it's less cruel and B, because there's a tremendous market out there for intelligent, social, uh, human compatible birds. This is when pet birds were starting to get quite popular in the Western world, in Europe, in the United States, and in the early 1960s. So someone said, my gosh, let's do that. So over the next decade, really, from the late 1950s in, uh, through the late 1960s, they were capturing and shipping out thousands and thousands of monk parakeets to destinations all over the world. They sent them, they sent them to, the, uh, to Europe. They sent them to uh, the United States. They sent them everywhere they could where there was a market. So while this is all going on, um, in the early 1970s, a, uh, a, a famous ornithologist who worked for the Museum of Natural History named John Bull, he just started noticing these green birds showing up. He didn't know what to make of it. Um, I think he even captured one. The first ones they saw were on Long Island, which is not that far where in this part of Long Island from Kennedy Airport. Now that's significant because Kennedy Airport, shipments coming in, birds appearing, maybe there's a connection here. So he actually started talking to people and that's what they said. They said, yeah, they're coming from the airport. We don't know exactly why this is happening, but that's the, prob you know, that's the probable cause of, of, of this disappearance. So let's talk about that airport a little bit. Here's a shot of the airport in the old days when before it was JFK, it was um, Idlewild very modernistic, very futuristic. And uh, something happened 54 years, to gay, uh, 54 years ago, as the Beatles used to say 20 years ago today, it was 54 years ago, something happened at the airport. Now this screen on the right, I just made with Photoshop. It's not really a, a representation, but something happened at the airport. Um, and there's the reason the airport seems to be the likely location is, is that within a 12.5 mile radius of the airport, which is well within the flying distance of a wild muck parakeet, we find most of the sightings. The other thing that's compelling about the airport theory without getting too much into conspiracies is there was a lot of crime and pilferage and general malfeasance and uh, criminality at the airport in the old days. You've seen the movie Goodfellas, you remember that memorable Lufthansa heist um, this is uh, our fellows from the movie here. Um, the theory is that a package came in, a big crate came in from Argentina one day, and the guys at the airport just did what they often did with it when a package came in. They opened it up to see if there was anything good inside. Maybe they wanted to bring some furniture home to mom or a couple of bottles of wine to their buddies. But what happened was they opened up this crate and it was full of parrots, and the parrots just did. What they do when you open a crate, they flew out and um, there was no insurance claim. There was no paper trail. Uh, there was just the closing of the box and then sort of the guys saying this, this never happened, you know, let the insurance figure this out. Um, the reason I have, I give credence to this theory is that I was contacted a few years ago by someone who claimed that her brother was working at the airport in the 19, uh, late 1960s. And that's exactly what happened. And, you know, as a, as a former journalist, I immediately said, well, can you get me in touch with your brother? Would he talk to me? And she said, absolutely not. And so that was the end of the trail. But Kennedy Airport uh, and other airports seem to be the source of, of uh, some of these releases. And uh, it just makes sense. If you're sending thousands of parrots through international airports, 
Uh, and, uh, you know, accidents may happen. Uh, there may be uh, criminality involved, but you see green birds and, and you, you kind of know why. Here's a sort of a map that, that projects where the parrots came from. Uh, on the lower right is the airport. And then they sort of flew in a westerly direction and they sort of split up over Brooklyn. And, and um, that's where we find them today as well as some other areas of, of New York City. A um, couple of myths that, I, that I've picked up along my 15 years of, of tracking these, these guys, that there was a tramp steamer that went down in the, uh, in the harbor. There's no record of that, but I, I love people's imagination. And you know the brave sailors, um, they couldn't save the ship, but they saved that one shipment of parrots and they flew across the water and they came to Brooklyn. Another theory, they came from New Jersey. I guess there are a lot of folks in Brooklyn who come to New Jersey, um, but uh, there's no evidence of that. There is talk that there was an aviary in, um, at the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens that was active in the 1940s, but then when World War II came along, they closed it down. And rather than finding homes for the birds, they just said, they, you know, they, they let them go. You know, live long and prosper, not our problem anymore. That's possible, but I've never been able to find any documentary uh, support for that. One of my favorite stories was told me by an old man near Brooklyn College. He said, he pointed up at the birds and they're all, on, on the fence, 20, 30 of them. He said, all those birds, you know where they came from? There was a little old lady who lived in that apartment right over there. She had two birds. And then one day, she was old, she died. Her children came to collect her possessions. They saw the two birds. They said, what are we going to do with these birds? They let them go. So like Adam and Eve, they... <laughs> They uh, begot and begot and begot, and uh, all the parrots in Brooklyn we have today are related to those two. I don't think there's any there's any real credence in this story, but there have been cases, and I think this is the case in in um, Austin, Texas, where 19 of them, maybe 19 is a magic number, 19 of them were released deliberately by someone who just wanted to let them go, and over the years they've begotten and begotten and begotten. And now Austin is home to a pretty good supply of them. So, you know, they, uh, they really, it's possible. Sometimes people ask me because, you know, there was a movement a hundred years or so ago of deliberately releasing certain desirable kinds of animals into environments. Um, I think it was called the aesthetic something or other movement, maybe one or more of you knows more about this than I do. But the idea of deliberately releasing creatures um, was a big thing um, 100, 120 years ago. And I think it culminated in, in this crazy decision to bring over 75 starlings and release them in New York. So, you know, there can be kind of catastrophic uh, effects of this kind of messing with m Mother Nature. Um, but anyway, Adam and Eve theory, I don't think that really happened. Another good story is that there was a husband and wife who ran a pet store in Brooklyn and due to a domestic, an irresolvable domestic dispute, the husband and wife just could not agree. The husband won the battle and, and, and for the contents of the pet store, but then one night the wife came in and just released all the birds and said, okay, you're gonna have all these empty cages, but that's it. Uh, I've never been able to really substantiate that. But again, you know, when, when you have monk parakeets, you're going to have a lot of speculation about them. So let's cut the speculation and go back to the facts here. When these birds started showing up in the early 1970s, it created enormous alarm. Uh, alarm among the newly formed environmental conservation agencies in the early 1970s. Remember, all those agencies really didn't happen. Uh, until I think it was the Nixon administration, the Clean Air Act and all that. It was about 1970, 72. Well, it even caused uh, alarm among those in Washington. And there was a uh, great concern that these green birds that were showing up at Brooklyn and a few other places were going to, like the starling, take hold, multiply, uh, turn into billions and billions of parrots and decimate our agricultural in, in, uh, infrastructure, decimate our agricultural economy, just ruin things. 
especially in agricultural states. So this was red, you know, this was the red alert blinking in Washington. And there was a program, it was under federal auspices, but with the cooperation of the, of the DECs, the Department of Agencies in, in New Jersey and in New York, an eradication program. So they sent snipers up here and they killed about 300 of them. Um, but they didn't get them all. And a famous story, which is actually in the after action reports of this task force, this eradication task force, is that there was a report of a major monk parakeet installation at Rikers Island. And of course, Rikers Island was on the list for this sniper team. But when they showed up at the island, the guy at the gate said, look, you know, I appreciate your bona fides here, but for you to do what you want to do, you need special permission. Maybe it was you can't bring telescopic rifles onto the onto the uh, you know uh, city property without a, a special permit. So he sent them away. They went back. They got the special permit. By the time they got back, though, there were no more there were no more monk parakeets on Rikers Island. So, and, and this is reported very you know it was almost a one hundred percent successful operation except for this one thing. Now I don't know what happened to those monk parakeets on Rikers Island. I don't know if they were, I don't know what happened to them, but there are quite a few of them in Queens now, which is pretty close to, to Rikers Island. So it really would have only been a five minute flight. So let's go and talk about what's been going on a little bit since the 1970s. And, you know, it hasn't been an easy ride for these parakeets. Uh, the utility companies regard them as uh, uh, vandals and saboteurs. Um, the people tend to like them, but they're, they're, because they build these enormous nests, they're the only parrot that, you know, you give them a fire escape, an air raid siren, uh, an air conditioner, uh, a, a, a church tower, a beautiful utility pole with a transformer underneath. And if you look at this transformer, there's actually a vent at the base of this transformer that blows hot air to cool the transformer. Well, that's where the parrots love to build their nests because it's kind of like having HVAC. You know, it's a tremendous flow of hot air which keeps them toasty warm during the winter. Unfortunately, it blocks the vent and it can cause an overload in the circuit. So the utility company guys come by and remove the nests from time to time. I don't begrudge them that because I'm not in favor of anyone losing power. My bone to pick, though, is when they do these removals, they often do them in a very cruel way or a way uh, or at a time of the year when there are babies in the nests. And that's just a terrible situation, a very cruel situation. The good news is that utility companies, some of them at least, are, are upping their game. And when they do these removals, they time them in a way so that there's, there's you know, minimal uh, harm to, to the next generation of parrots, but also um, they can still do these removals. But anyway, that's that's been going on. Also, poaching about 10 years ago, this hasn't been going on recently, but there were people going around stealing them, I guess, believing they were incredibly valuable. They do have a market value. Um, you know, if you go in and try to acquire a, 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 a Quaker parrot, you, you can get one for 150, 200 bucks, legal to sell in New York uh, and, and in other states, but illegal in many other states, again, for the fears that some people will will get them. They'll escape. They'll establish themselves in the in the wild, and you know they'll they'll wreak havoc. They'll go, although again, they create a nuisance in my opinion. But havoc and you know following the pattern of the starling never happened. So let's talk about what these birds are like up close and personal. Well, they are aggressive and they often fight, but I've never seen them fight any other species except themselves. They have arguments. There are obviously tensions, especially around mating season, and they do go at it, but you know, no one ever gets bloody, and it's a lot of sort of performative aggression. Um, master builders of the bird world, as alluded to before, they can build, uh, they, and they often love to build around athletic fields where there's a lot of great grass for them to eat. They're native grass eaters in Argentina, but they can build under air conditioning vents in high power transmission substations in uh, utility poles and uh, 
they're fascinating to watch. I mean, they don't work during the nighttime hours, but during the day, they just are, they're tireless. They have some kind of crazy work ethic. You can't stop them. And they're perfectionists. It's like the nest is never 100% perfect. There's always someone who's going around making adjustments and you know, making things just right. So uh, if you have nothing better to do, if you know, you can, you, it, watching a Quaker nest is more entertaining than watching many a Netflix miniseries, in my opinion. Um, they're social. They love to do stuff together. Of course, there's safety in numbers and they're always very careful. You know, they've got these eyes on the side of their heads, which gives them a sort of a 360 vision. There's always a bird or a number of birds who are just watching the skies. Even as they work, they're constantly looking around. They're kind of paranoid in the way that many New Yorkers are, but it makes sense because they have real enemies. But here is a big flock of them. This was shot in Edgewater, New Jersey, which is this little hamlet right across the river from um, Manhattan. And I think this is more than 100 of them. This is the biggest group I've ever been able to get in one shot. Um, but there they are. And that's, I think that's about 80 of them flying in the sky. This is the biggest crop I've ever seen, or excuse me, the biggest flock I've ever seen. I don't know if they're still together. This is about 10 years ago. But what happens often is they'll form a big flock. And then I think that at a certain point, it's almost like they run out of housing and they run out of resources. So the, the, the flock will split. And so you might have 75 birds in the flock and then you'll show up a year later. It's like, what happened? The flock is half the size. It doesn't mean they got eaten. It's just that the flock split and they, they dispersed elsewhere, um, but not very far, usually within a few miles of where the flock originated. This gives, you know, this gives them this characteristic. They're not migratory, they're sedentary. I love the term sedentary, it means sitting down. I mean, once they sit down in a place they like, you can't get them out of that chair, um, which makes them very hard to remove. But if you like them, it's, you know, they wanna stay. Um, wide ranging diet. They eat a lot of different things. They love the leaf buds. They eat that during the winter. That keeps them alive. They uh, will go out and find any bird feeders you've got filled with suet or millet or anything else. They'll, you know, a scout will find that bird feeder, re report it back to the flock, and then they'll show up almost like a motorcycle gang and they'll just clear it out. So if you want to feed these guys, prepare to spend a fair amount of money on bird food because uh, they're hungry during the winter. But they can live and subside on leaf buds. Um, and then the other thing, of course, during the, they love berries, they'll eat horse chestnuts. The one on the lower right hand corner, they actually have been seen, at least by me, to eat seaweed. I think it's kind of unusual for a parrot. This was taken up right along the Hudson River, but they like that seaweed. I guess it's like spirulina and has all these nutritional benefits. Uh, they fit in with the community. I'm editorializing here, but among the people who, uh, uh, you know, who, who love them, they love them and they'll, they'll do things to protect them. This little thing, uh, this little statuette here is from Brooklyn College where an artist actually commemorates them, commemorates their presence. And then um, uh, until the advent of the de Blasio administration, Mike Bloomberg's administration had the Quaker parakeet or a representation thereof as the official mascot of New York City's Office of Sustainability. And uh, they did not consult with me on this. I had nothing to do with it. But they decided, you know, this monk parakeet, let's make it a symbol of New York and the future of New York and the ecological integrity of New York. And so Birdie, who was, uh, you know, the, the Birdie costume was worn at many of these events. And it was, was in a lot of different subway ads. And I'm all for this. I'm all for, for changing the image of the monk parakeet from, you know, dangerous invader, dangerous avian, it's going to be like the starling from hell, to like fitting in. It's, it's, if, if you have parrots in your neighborhood, you probably have a very good ecosystem. It's a good sign. Again, I'm kind of getting worked up here, but this is, this is, <laughs> this is what I do. I think they're really, they fit in perfectly with, with New York City, um, even though they, you know, they're obviously not from here. Their ancestors weren't from here, but hint, hint. We're a nation of immigrants, a city of immigrants, and as long as you behave yourself within certain bounds, you're welcome. So this is a map I did a few years ago of where the colonies were in Brooklyn. I don't know how familiar folks are with Brooklyn. I grew up in Manhattan, and, and you know, to me, Brooklyn was like Australia. It took me years to figure out when any, where, where anything was. 
But um, this map has changed over the years. The, the monk parakeets um, have sort of, the, the, the colony, the strongest colony now is at Greenwood Cemetery. And I would encourage anyone coming to New York uh, at any time of the year uh, to visit Greenwood Cemetery. You can get here by public transportation. It's a quick subway ride away. It is about 400 acres of um, private property, the cemetery, but it has an amazing variety of, of wildlife, bird life, plant life, and it also happens to be where you'll find most of the monk parakeets. Now they built these incredibly large nests right at the top of the tower. And when I first saw this, I wondered like, why is the cemetery put up with this? I mean, they're kind of modifying the architecture of this beautiful 1840 era Gothic um, cathedral-like structure. But it turns out that the monk parakeets actually keep the pigeons away. Now, I'm not an anti-pigeon person, but the, 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 the pigeon guano has a very bad effect on the brownstone. It erodes it, it corrodes it, it weakens it. But the monk parakeet guano is just, I guess it's not acidic or it's, you can even wash it off with a little rainfall. But the, the, cemetery, the cemetery management has actually encouraged these parrots to be there. Um, and so this is really the best place they can be with one caveat, and I'll get into that a little bit later. But Greenwood Cemetery, that's, that's the, the parrot hotspot in Brooklyn. They do live elsewhere, but lately they've been kind of moving from publicly accessible areas to private property, and I'll explain why. Greenwood Cemetery, that's where I would go. Uh, you'll see them flocking. You can show up at any time of the day during the winter, right before sunset, which is probably about three, four o'clock. Um, you'll find them very, very active. And uh, bring a telephoto camera or a telephoto lens if you if you can. But sometimes you can get lucky; they'll come down to the ground, and you can sneak up with them and get some nice portraits. Brooklyn College. Now, when I started uh, tracking these parrots, there was a big colony at Brooklyn College, which is sort of in the middle of Brooklyn. Unfortunately, over the years, um, the original athletic field, which was grass, a little bit kind of run down. You know, they the college got some money and they decided to upgrade it. Unfortunately, they upgraded that field with AstroTurf, which is basically plastic. Um, after they did that, you, know, you just don't see any birds around anymore. The birds uh, just, they don't like the AstroTurf. I guess it's good for the athletes. It's probably good for the budget of the college because they have to spend less time, you know, uh, maintaining the grass. But it's really, if, if I'm going to get polemical here at all, it's like, I'm anti-AstroTurf. I'm sorry. If you're at all interested in birds and, you know, if you just want to get rid of birds, put down the AstroTurf, they're not going to come back. And that's, that appears to, what happened, to be what happened at Brooklyn College. They left the campus, they moved into sort of an adjoining area, um, and, but now they've left that adjoining area and they're almost impossible to see. They are in the Bronx up by Pelham Bay Park. Similar situation, you have a big athletic field, a little bit overgrown, under-maintained, but around that you've got the big lights. The parrots love those lights. They're 100 feet up or 75, 100 feet up. Uh, very few hum humans ever go up there, uh, but they have a sort of a, a uh, this is called a sub-platform, or it's a platform underneath, like an access platform. It's an ideal place for the birds to build these tremendous nests. So they're active in the Bronx. Whitestone Queens, again, not so far from Rikers Island. Uh, sort of the high ground up in Whitestone. They, they have built quite a few nests in utility, uh, utility poles and a problem for Con Edison, but you know, they haven't, Con Edison doesn't have a lethal eradication policy towards them, fortunately, excuse me, but they do remove the nests. And I only ask that they not do it in the dead of winter because that can be very, very difficult for the birds. The birds can tolerate the cold, but you know, it's, it's just not a good thing. Um, Long Island. Now, there are quite a few of them in Long Island uh, along the South Shore. I don't know how familiar folks are with Long Island. I spent some time there. There's sort of like two different Long Islands. There's the North Shore, which is very, you know, the Great Gatsby, wealthy, very, very nice. And then there's the South Shore, which is a little more downscale, but in a way it's nicer. People are less snooty, yada, yada, yada. But the birds like that South Shore. 
Seaford. So Amityville, Seaford, a few other colonies, the people seem to like them. That makes a big difference. If the people like them, the birds will tend to be okay. People don't like them, though. All it takes is a quick call to the utility company of Verizon, and you know, you've know you got someone out there removing the nests. Um, again, typical scenario here. We have a beautiful athletic field out here. I think this is in Seaford, and I can't see it really. You can't see this on, on this, but uh, they built nests around the field. Again, the food's right out for them, uh, and they can go up in a very, very well-protected uh, uh, scenario up in those nests. Let's talk a little bit about New Jersey because New Jersey's right across the river from New York City. There's a big, big colony of them in Edgewater. Um, if you come to New York, you wanna to get to Edgewater, it's a quick bus ride from the Port Authority or probably even a cab ride. But um, they have nested in trees right alongside what this, this, this road. And the reason I have this photo here is that um, this is back in 2009. You see how lush those trees are? This is when the parrots had a lot of nests there. In 2019, those nests, were, excuse me, those trees were cut back, but you can see there's still a nest in here. And in 2021, the trees have completely come back and those parrots are all nesting in a tree. I haven't been out there since COVID, I haven't been out there, um, but that's probably the place I'm gonna go next as soon as you know I can get free for, for a little bit of time out to New Jersey because the odd thing about New Jersey is there are so many of them, but they're actually on the list of forbidden species. They're illegal to own and they're illegal to uh, traffic or do anything else. And I see it's 144. So I've been doing the talking for 45 minutes and you've all been silent. Can, can you still hear me? You're doing great, Steve. Oh, all right. <laughs> I just want to make great. sure that, you know. Be on right. great. Keep at I it. Just want to. I, we're, 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 I want to keep things on focus here because I do want to hear from you and I want to hear your questions because, and your observations because I often learn so much from, from, uh, from other people uh, with a different POV. Um, let's go on beyond Brooklyn a little bit. This is a nice graph from the Audubon Society. Down at the bottom, you can see this is from last 14 years. There have been 42,000 sightings of the month parakeet in multiple states. Um, this is, again, the most frequently seen parrot or parakeet. Uh, and then we have the red-crowned Amazon, 15,000 sightings. They are not anywhere around the Northeast. They're, I believe, in the, in the Southwest. And then the Nande parakeet, I've never seen any of them in the Northeast, but apparently they're also thriving in Florida, which is pretty much a tropical environment. So things are pretty easy for the birds down there. New York City and the, the, the Northeast, it's a, it's a more challenging environment. So that's where we're at. Uh, um, but let's go on to some, before I conclude, some threats and opportunities here. So, you know, pirates have not had an easy time here. Um, what are their threats? What's, and they're not endangered. They're not on any endangered species list, but at the same time, colonies can be negatively impacted by certain things that are going on. Organized eradication efforts. Again, we saw this in Connecticut in 2006. Um, it did have a toll. I am told that there are about 400 of them now in, in Connecticut. And, and maybe if that eradication effort hadn't happened, there might be a thousand, but there's still a good population there. The thing that happened in Connecticut shocked so many people and it caused actually a lawsuit, which was unsuccessful, but it really did mobilize the, the, the bird loving community to say, you know, this is wrong. What you guys are doing is wrong. I mean, capture them and, and send them to a zoo if you have to, but not a mass killing event, not a mass killing plan. And, and that's pretty much what happened. It caused a lot of bad feelings. There were protests. Um, I didn't really get involved with this except sort of as, a, as an outside supporter, but the people on the ground uh, really were outraged. The good news is, I think that the utility company is going to have to think hard and long about doing this again, because this story went out all, all over the wires. It was even picked up by Al Jazeera, you know, which is so, so, you know, if you want negative PR for your utility, your, your utility company, go after some, some cute birds and see what happens. And remember, utility companies have a special sort of situation in our, in our economy. They're monopolies. They're legal monopolies. They're regulated by you know, uh, public utility commissions. So they are sensitive. 
to the fact that, well, I can't just, if I'm angry at Con Edison, I can't just switch to another company. I'm stuck with them. And I'm not bad mouthing Con Edison. But um, so this eradication, these, these, these movements to eradicate come and go right now. No one's thinking about that. No one's talking about that except overseas. And we'll talk about that a little bit at the end, perhaps. Poaching, poaching hasn't been a real issue. It has happened. It's not going on right now. Loss of habitat, I think that's the big one. Um, it's a wonderful idea for the athletes. The athletes do like it when you put in a AstroTurf field, but wildlife really doesn't like it. And I wish there was a way um, to have green fields, um, more green fields and fewer plastic fields. Poor coordination among agencies with bird control responsibilities. Often the utility companies will pick a, a contractor to do the removals. And these contractors sometimes know what they're doing. And they're sometimes sensitive to the fact that you got to handle these. You know, if you're recovering a bunch of babies, you got to take care of them. You, you know, you can't just throw them down. This happened in Long Island recently, and it, it caused a tremendous upset in the community. Uh, the company called in to do the removals around uh, these light poles around, a, around an athletic field. They picked a contractor who had no experience and there was, there was a lot of mortality and a lot of really bad feelings. And now what happens? It's like, well, the contractor company said, well, sorry, um, but this should not be allowed to happen again. I don't know exactly how we prevent it, but certainly better vetting on the part of utility companies in terms of choosing a contractor who has done this before and is sensitive to wildlife. Um, so those are some of the threats. Now, I also have to bring this up because, I mean, I, I like raptors. I'm sure you like raptors too. Magnificent hawks, kestrels, falcons, uh, birds of prey. It's, a, it's an inspiring thing to see in New York City when you see a hawk in the sky and you say, wow, I mean, that's, that's like, <laughs> it's like, like a supernatural presence. But there are a lot of them now. There are at least three kestrels who have moved into Greenwood Cemetery. And this is more than I've ever seen before. There used to be one. Now there are three. They're presumably a family. They're giving the parrots a hard time. And I'm concerned about this. I don't know really what I can do about it or whether the cemetery can do anything about it. Uh, but this is the price you pay for uh, having a more a healthier a friend of mine says, you know, she's sort of conspiracy mind. It's like, yeah, they introduced them. They put those kestrels there. I don't think that happens. I think the kestrels just show up and, and it's a great environment for them because they can feed on a lot of voles and moles and mice and squirrels, but also they feed on, they tend to go after the other birds too. So this is a threat that I'm actively watching, but again, I'm kind of helpless. What can I do about it? And I certainly can't bring a 22 rifle out of the grounds of a of a private private property in Brooklyn, without someone said, someone saying, "Can't do that, folks." And it's also against sort of the the non-intervention. It's like Star Trek. Remember what was the prime directive? You're not supposed to mess with with these alien civilizations. But sometimes watching these test drills, it's like, oh boy, go parrots. Um, anyway. Opportunities. What do we need here in Brooklyn? Again, I'm not a I'm not a shill for Mike Bloomberg, but Mike Bloomberg, who was the mayor uh, for quite a few years, he had a million trees planted. This is great for parrots. It's great for all the birds. More trees, more perching room, less astroturf, please. Um, the poaching rings have been busted. Uh, they're no longer active. Uh, greater awareness on the part of people. I don't know if this has been enhanced through COVID, but a lot of people wound up spending a lot of time at home. So they might have opened the windows and noticed, hey, you know, there's a whole world out here. There, there's wildlife, there's stuff. There's, there's a lot of drama going on in the extra human sphere. There's a lot happening. And just the beauty of going for a walk, um, you know, we've all been shut down and locked up for so long. I think at least in my case, when I went out for a walk, it was like, wow, the world, what is this thing? It's not on my computer. Um, so more awareness about, you know, healthy ecosystems and urban environments, better vetted contractors. Um, and then uh, before I go to questions, I will say there are some troubling things going on. Madrid apparently has 12,000 wild Quaker parrots. And I think they've just had enough of them. They've, they've, they've you know, they've, they've overstepped their welcome and there's a plan to eradicate them. 
And I know in the UK, uh, there are quite a few Quakers. I think they've killed all of them except for like 50. So, you know, this is happening a long, a long distance away from me, um, but uh, it does, it's, it's sort of heartbreaking. I don't know what one can do except to say, if you, if you can control them in another way, that's in a lethal way, please explore all of those avenues before you resort to the, the deadly means. I don't want to leave this on a somber note, but I mean, this is sort of when you're living in wild Quaker land, it's always like, oh my God, you know, I thought everything was all right, but now what's going to happen? So it's dramatic. Anyway, I think I probably talked enough for, for now. Maybe I can take some questions. That sounds great. I uh, can only say, wow, Steve, wow. As usual, you are charming, articulate, oh, entertaining, and informative. And I just like to make a personal request that you write a novel because <laughs> it would be so good to read something written by you. So um, we do have just a few questions. Uh, I'm not sure you know, what you may have knowledge of, but um, have you seen any uh, mutilating Quakers in the wild. We do see them so often in captivity. Um, I have never, I have never, I have never seen that. I have seen some birds who appear to have been scarred, uh, you know, like with a sort of a, like a mark, uh, which suggests a run-in with another creature, mm. uh, perhaps another Quaker, or perhaps a, you know a run-in with a falcon or or another predator or. Um, you know, the, the other thing that I've seen, but I've never seen any any case of self mutilation. I, I, I don't I don't know enough about that topic to be able to say that it's it's never happened among birds, um, but or that it's a product of what happens or what can happen to birds in captive environments. But I've never seen it. I've seen you know I've seen some tough looking Quakers who it looks like they it look like they've been through a um, little bit of a rumble, but but never that. Yeah, it's definitely a problem in captivity, probably because they're bored and, you know, the diet's pretty iffy, but they just don't have enough action. It's a pretty common problem for a lot of parrots, but Quakers seem to have a special problem with uh, chest feather plucking disorders. And, you know, I've been to see a lot of birds in the wild and it's, it's very, it's not very common that you see that in the wild. So, but you never know. Um, have you seen any Quakers in Central Park? Um, hold on a second. There's a motorcycle going by. That's part of the fun of being in Brooklyn. Um, I have, um, I've gone and looked, I've gone and looked for them in Central Park. I've never actually seen them. Um, I know there were, were reports, this is going back many years, that they had, uh, Quakers had built nests in this obelisk behind the Metropolitan Museum called, I think it's called Cleopatra's Needle. Um, but I went there and I saw no evidence of it. I think, now I, I have lately gotten some anecdotal reports whose reliability is somewhat questionable, but, but that they've heard and seen them in Central Park. Um, but it's been a tough, it's tough in Central Park. They, they've, whenever they've attempted to set up a nest in Central Park, the parks department has removed the nest. Mm. And, I, and I think that, you know, that's, that's a conscious decision that they've made. They, they regard them um, as, um, I think, in a kind of a patronizing way. They're not really indigenous. You know, they're not migratory. They're not songbirds. They're just like, you know, uh, they're, they're second or third tier in importance. And, and I, think, I think that they, they also do fear that, that like the starlings, you know, they're going to multiply and multiply and, 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 and crowd the other birds out. I've never seen any evidence of this, but, but I, I can see from a, from a sort of a wildlife management perspective, um, them really trying to curate the, 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 the species that in Central Park. So um, I can't say there are none in Central Park. I've never seen them. Um, and I know that they have powerful opponents in the city. Uh, who don't want them there. Do you have a sense of um, that they build a nest in one year and then they move on someplace, you know, the next year? Or do you see the same nest being reutilized? Do you have any, you know, social 
insights to their behavior that way? I think um, I. I think that when, when a nest is established, and then when a nest is established, it's usually very small. It's usually one pair, probably raising one youngster, and then they'll build one, and you know, that will take them, oh, I don't know, a month or so. And then that, that nest might be there you know, in, in, in its sort of starter state for, for a year or so. But then if there are other birds in the community, or if, or if that, that youngster uh, eventually acquires a mate, and uh, that youngster may bring that mate in to sort of build an adjacent, it's almost like building a porch onto a one family house. And they sort of build, they, they like to add to an existing structure. I right? think that, that it's sort of, it, perhaps, it's, perhaps it's sort of respect for the energy investment that's made. I mean, when that decision is made to build that nest at that location, again, I can't really say how much thought has gone into it, but. I would imagine there, there is quite a bit of thought that goes into it or instinct. I think it's probably thought, but, you know, is this protected enough? Are there predators around? Is there a food source within a 30 second flight? Is there a source for twigs within a 20 second flight? They have to sort of hit all those items on their checklist and then and only then will the nest go in. Um, and if that nest is removed, they, you know, um, the birds will usually just sort of back off, wait for the trucks to remove, uh, to, 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 to leave. And then they'll go in and they'll try to rebuild that um, nest right where it was. I think this is behavior that, that, that the folks who have uh, captive Quakers know they're very territorial. They don't like their toys moved. You know, everything has a position. Everything has to be <laughs> right before it's right. And uh, they're almost like OCD in that, in that respect, which may, may, may provide them an environment or provide them a, an advantage. But um, at the same time, they will move. If they have to move, they will move. Uh, and uh, they will sometimes abandon, you know, things get really bad in a certain area. It's almost like there, there's a group decision, we're out of here. And then they'll off, they'll take off in a bunch, maybe six, maybe 12, maybe 18, maybe only two, but they'll try to find another place where that secret checklist is all checked off. And then they'll, they'll try to reestablish there. But it, it seems to take a lot of, a lot of push for them to leave that one place that it's almost like, this is the birthplace of my elders. I shall not leave it. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, having uh, seen them in the wild, especially in Brazil, where they had really, really big nests under Jabaru nests, um, I always wanted to look inside to see if there were like apartments or a community room or a dormitory <laughs> or, you know, have you ever seen a dismantled nest to see what the inside looks like? Because they pop their heads out of different holes, you know? Yes, yes. Um, I actually had the, the, the strange privilege of being up in a cherry picker a few years ago where they were removing a nest and they wanted, I guess they couldn't find anybody else, but they wanted me to like inspect the nest to make sure there was nobody in there before they removed it. And, and I, I, I went up in that cherry picker, I was a little nervous, but they, you know, they had me like attached via a safety belt and all of this. Um, but I, 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 I didn't know what to expect, but I, I reached in and the, the, the portals don't seem to be connected at all. There's no like central corridor. Uh, it seems each one of those portals leads to sort of like a little dead end, um, which maybe makes sense because let's say if a predator got in through a portal, you wouldn't want him rampaging through the entire, you know, the entire complex. You'd want him to have the dead end and, and then back out. And by hopefully by that time, the, um, uh, you know, the parrots will be able to devise a, uh, defensive strategy but the predators sometimes will do that the crows will you know they'll poke their noses in they'll try to get the eggs or uh, the, the, unfortunately the, the kestrels seem to go in then there if they're looking for babies but but but, but my, my long answer to your short question is that each one of those portals is just sort of its own self-contained studio apartment well that makes sense that gives them privacy and like you were saying earlier they're very meticulous um we find a lot of Quakers are relinquished in captivity because people label them mean because they try to go inside the cage, which is absolutely not appreciated by the Quaker who responds very defensively and appropriately 
but you know once they come out of the cage they're very social so that probably is in alignment with what you're saying um, yeah, I, th I think it makes sense because you know there's so much of the life of the quaker that happens in that nest mm -hmm. um they they spent of course they spent all night there you know uh they during the cold months they they sort of snuggle together i mean it can be very very cold um and uh, but given that good insulation you know and, and the, the body heat they they there's a lot of they're very domestic in that sense that's where they're they're young are born um and you know the the babies have to be really protected in there for 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 quite a while before they can fledge and get out so so yeah that would make sense that you know, don't mess with i don't know it's sort of like the heart of the home you know that privacy a little privacy please yeah especially for the quakers absolutely so uh, do you see them ever uh somebody wanted to know if you see them interacting with other birds or other animals like squirrels uh, for food sources especially you know when things are slim picking. I've, I've seen them aggressively i won't say attack squirrels because they've never actually you know but they they buzz them because what the squirrels will sometimes do, especially if you have a Quaker nest in a parrot pole, excuse me, a power pole, you know, the squirrels will often use those lines to, to get across. And of course, they'll wind up sort of blundering their way across the nest on their way. And the parrots do not, do not like that at all. Um, there have also been cases um, where, you know, the squirrels have actually, the, the Quakers often get blamed for starting fires. In, in, in not that there are that many fires, but there have been occasional fires in these things, uh, in these power poles, which is not good for the utility grid. But um, the squirrels are often more to blame for that than the Quakers, because the Quakers are small enough. So if they perch on a positive line, they're not going to make a con connection to a negative line. But the score, you know, these high voltage uh, positive and negative leads, but the squirrels are big enough so they can actually go and connect and form a circuit across a high voltage positive and negative connection and, and it electrocutes the squirrel the squirrel goes up in flames and the nest burns up and everyone blames the parrots so i think they know that the squirrels are trouble i've never seen them attack them in terms of interacting with other birds you know they'll they'll form common feeding flocks with pigeons sparrows starlings um and you know i've never seen them go after um you know any one of the 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 dominant uh, species of birds we find in New York City, which again are you know starlings, pigeons, and sparrows. So they seem to get along very well with 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 the other wildlife. Um, but again, they don't like squirrels, and they definitely don't like predators. When a predator shows up, it's like you know it's like those uh, air raid sirens from the 1950s. You know it's it's like red alert. Yeah. Everybody run. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what is the largest predator in your experience? The the birds of prey? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, again, it's a, it's a good thing. And, and I know there are a lot of raptor fans uh, in this city. Um, but, you know, the hawks, red tail hawks, um, they're amazing. They're, 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 you can see them often in Brooklyn. You see them in Prospect Park. You see them in Greenwood Cemetery. They, uh, they, they go after pigeons, they go after, you know, uh, they go after squirrels, mice and voles and so forth. But I've seen them go after the parrots. I've never seen them get one. Uh, kestrels and falcons, they've been showing up more and more. Again, I don't, I don't know why exactly that is. Uh, it, it is certainly a good thing. There probably were kestrels and falcons here, you know, a thousand years ago, 500 years ago. Um, but it's, you know, um, that, let's see, who else? Um, that's pretty much, that's pretty much it. You know, the, the other predator they have, of course, is human beings. And, you know, I've, I've seen them, I've seen, you know, because they fly very close to the ground when they're, you know, and they fly in this crazy pattern. I've, I saw, this character, This is not an unhappy story, but, but uh, near Brooklyn College, there was a pair flying very low to the ground. One of them was struck by an automobile. Um, it wasn't badly hurt, but was knocked sort of unconscious temporarily onto the street. And it was fascinating because the other bird didn't continue. The other bird came back and hovered mm. right over her mate or his mate. Mm. And then the other bird recuperated, got back on, you know, got, got back in flight and only then they continue. And so, you know, they, 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 they have been, they, they got to watch it with, with cars 
Um, but but that instance taught me just to sort of this sort of that tight bond. Mm-hmm. You're not going to leave. It's like the Marines. You're not going to leave a man on the ground. You know, you're not you're, you know, you're not going to leave a bird behind. You're going to stay with that mate, even if it's going to endanger your own life. That loyalty is so powerful. That's amazing. Well, they are certainly good role models for us in many ways, aren't they? <laughs> I'd, I'd like to think so. Although, yeah. although again, sometimes they overdevelop. I mean, I've seen that they're they're great architects and builders, but sometimes they'll actually sort of overdevelop a property uh, to the point <laughs> that it becomes over uh, unwieldy and, and, and collapse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when these when these Quaker when these Quaker nests occasionally get blown out of a tree, it's almost like you'd think it would fall, it, it would it would um, be destroyed, but they're all they're almost like big Brillo pads. They'll fall <laughs> to the bottom and just bounce. Um, so I'd know, like yeah, to be I, there to cut into one of those and see what's on the inside. That sounds like a great opportunity for more investigation. Yeah, when, somebody. When, Somebody wanted to know if you've noticed um, if there are different specialties in the group, like some are the builders, some are the sentries, some are the foragers. Have you noticed anything that specific? I'd like to say that I have, but I, but, but you know, I have a problem identifying individuals. Know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. They, they all wear the same. They uniform. all look the same. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, so it, it, I, I'm not sure if this is, this bird is doing double, triple, quadruple duty, or if there are four different ones that came in and doing different things. They, uh, I do think that the males will assist the females in raise in, in sitting on the egg, they, they and, and and sort of helping to feed the young. Um, I don't have any original evidence for that, but I but I've heard that the males and the females will sort of cooperate in that task. You know, the male will come in and say, "Listen, honey." You've been on the egg all week. You know, let me handle this for a while. You can go out and be a movie. Um, so, but again, I've never, I, I can't substantiate that from an observation. Yeah, it, it does seem to, I think there's more uh, knowledge we need about all species in that regard, but we do know that some species are helpful that way and some are not. So, yeah. Um, well, what is your favorite thing about Quakers? Oh golly, that, that's a tough question. I mean, what's not to love? Um, you know, my my favorite thing about them is they're still here. They're still here. They have been here for fifty or more years, and mm-hmm. you know, um, that's. And I wish, you know, I'm I'm sixty five. I wish I, I knew about this when I was fifteen. It might have changed my whole life. I might have become an ornithologist. Um, not that I did it so badly, but I mean, you know, if I had known about these birds back then um probably would have made my life a little a little richer and happier but the fact that they're still here and and you know there there are they're all over the country and they seem to really uh i know um the ones down in texas there was a very cold winter this year and they were worried about them freezing but they sort of bounced back apparently Parts in Connecticut, they were, you know, so many of them were killed, but populations bouncing back um, here in Brooklyn. Um, you know, they, they, there's a magical quality to them. And maybe, you know, you have to be sort of a bird fanatic to get it, but, but there's this surreal, strange, beautiful um, feeling that, that you get when you look up and you sort of, I mean, if it, it if parrots can if parrots can do okay in Brooklyn, then anything's possible. That's good. I love that. I love that. I think that's a perfect place for us to end because you have said it all. They're magical. They're beautiful. We're glad they're here. So thank Amen. you for loving them, watching them, being their advocate. And um, I hope you'll continue to do it and come back and give us an update because you're by far one of the best speakers we've ever had, Steve. Oh, thank you so much, Anna. You, much you, appreciated. Th- terrific. Thank you to you. Thank you to you and your team uh, for, for, for doing this. And, and I'd love to meet up with you virtually or, or in, in person soon again. That's great. And we'll definitely put this on our um, YouTube channel and on our website and hope that more people will develop your kind of appreciation for their well-being and futures. So... Thanks everybody for being here. Big thanks to Steve. Uh, It's been a good day for parrots. So thanks.
Bye, everyone.